for joining. Yeah, nice to see you, uh, and I hope you're keeping well. Hello, after, yes. After a long time. Most Good evening, Doctor. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Doctor. So most best, we begin the session. Most uh, dignified speaker for the day, Professor Darlin A. Kluka, who is currently the Vice President of the XP International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education and a member of the Cosmo Boards of Directors. When you talk of this, I think a very high dignified post being a director of the Cosmo Board, especially with sport management. She has served as the charter member of the USA Volleyball Sports Medicine and Performance Commission, Vice President of the USA Volleyball, President of the National Association for Girls and Women in Sport, as well as the International Association for Physical Education for Sport for Girls and Women, and Deputy Delegate to the United States Olympic Committee. Luca has been president of the prestigious XP Philip Noel Baker Research Award, leader in volleyball award, inducted into the American Volleyball Coaches Hall of Fame, National Association of Sport and Physical Education, which was NASPE, now SHAPE, Hall of Fame, Commission on Sport Management Accreditation, that is COSMA, Hall of Fame, in the Master Professor category, and Illinois State University of Applied Science and Technology, Hall of Fame. She has also been selected as a distinguished alumnus of Texas Women's University. Dani Nekluka has earned two doctoral degrees, one in motor learning from Texas Women's University in Texas, USA, the other in sport management at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. She has a, had a distinguished career in education for 45 years. After several years at the high school level, she invested substantial years at the Grambling State University and Barry University, where she retired as a dean of School of Human Performance and Leisure Sciences. You can now provide consultation, education, training, and research in sport leadership, curriculum design, social change, development, strategic planning, and publication. Her research interests include sport in women in sport and governance, as well as visual skills in sport. She has published three texts over 120 juried articles, presented professional research papers on five continents. Indeed, ma'am, we are honored because we have an outstanding we say volleyball an international who's been with the Olympics for the uh, volleyball, an academician, administrator, and at the top, a great human. So, in, on behalf of the Ministry of Sports, uh, Ministry of Youth Peasant Sports, Government of India, Halo India, a warm welcome to our most dignified speaker, Dr. Darlene Kluka. Welcome to the session. I, I also am welcome. So oh, sorry. I also welcome Dr. Yuri. We have, I said this, uh, this platform is very heavy now because we have, it's all with presidents and vice presidents. I welcome our president of uh, XP, Dr. Yuri, for your presence. I welcome Dr. Rosa, who's again the uh, president of the Interna International Association for Sport for Women and Girls. I also welcome Beatrice Ferreira, welcome Maria Lucy, Dr. G. Kishore, our principal, Dr. Sanjay Prajapati, all the invited guests and my dear teachers, my dear friends, a warm welcome to one and all. Over to you, Dr. Dali Kluka. Well, I sincerely appreciate, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. And I'm very, very excited. So I'm going to uh, wait until um, Dr. Sanjay puts up the slides from the beginning. And then we'll go forward. Okay, um, as soon as we push the button on um, running the um, slideshow, are we all set running the slideshow, sir? Sanjay, are we good, sweetness? Yeah, Ma'am. Okay, so uh, what we're going to uh, what we're going to look at today, and if you would put the next slide on, please.
Thank you. Uh, what we will look at today is a, a little bit about uh, drill and lesson slash session design. And we will also look at selected sports science principles and applications in lesson, lessons and sessions. And then we'll talk a little bit about collaboration to share and build better for India. Uh, I've had a wonderful experience listening and participating to all of the sessions from the first batch. And I look forward to learning so much more uh, from this batch. And uh, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, many times we do not know what it is that we're um, communicating to people that they learn. And uh, so there will be times, I suppose, in life where we don't know what someone's talking about until a few weeks, a few days, a few months, a few years later. And all of a sudden it goes, aha, is that what we've been thinking about and what was trying to be taught? So uh, hopefully this is going to give you some ideas on how to teach, but more importantly, how to present material so that people will want to learn. You cannot teach anybody anything. You can only put things forward to make sense so that they will want to learn it. Uh, that's that's a, a huge piece. It's not about us and how good we look. It's about, are they learning what they're trying, uh, what we're trying to get across to them. So if you, it, by the way, isn't that uh, the second uh, picture, the black and white picture, isn't that so cute? So, so yeah. the next time when you have children, find someone to take a picture of that like that, because that says many, many things about what it is that you're attempting to do not only in life, but also through physical education and community sport coaching. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. All right, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite areas, uh, motor learning and performance. And, uh, you know, uh, there is not any way possible yet for us to really directly measure learning. But there is a way to infer learning through performance. And so one of the things that's so interesting to me about learning and physical learning and motor learning is that we have the opportunity to present things and then through action we get to see well is it appropriate is it acceptable uh is it uh, uh great to do whatever it is in order to solve the challenge that we have so uh, i want to share with you some thoughts about what is motor learning and what is performance uh, motor learning has to do with an internal process. It has to be each person's ability to be able to uh, figure out how to make a relatively permanent change in a performance. And usually that's through practice, but it's also through practice and quality practice. So, you know, uh, we've been talking uh, about, and we will be talking again, I'm sure, in the future about quality um, physical education or QPE. Well, we can say kind of the same thing for uh, quality community coaching or QCC, if we want to make up a new acronym. So, uh, but it's got to be some type of a change in the performance because that's the only way that I or you or anyone can kind of assess what is really going on. Have we really learned anything? Well, we have to also take into consideration that it's providing the change is not attributed to a human's maturation. All right, so just because uh, a, a child gets up and learns to walk 
that could be attributed to human maturation or they learn to crawl. That could be human maturation. A temporary state is if we are uh, <clears throat> a little high on uh, marijuana or daha, or if we're a little drunk, a little tipsy from um, alcohol. And another part of it ha could have to do with instinct. Um, uh, we as humans do not have as many instincts as um, a duck or a goose or some type of a wild bird. They have many more instincts for survival. <clears throat> the last piece is performance. And very simply put, uh, performance is an act at a moment in time. An act as a moment in time. And when we act, we're also saying that that is voluntary or volitional because action has to be generated from the brain. And for anyone who says that the brain and the body are not connected and it's only important for us to be very smart in our brain and cognition, um, I think we could build a pretty close case to uh, why the brain and the body are intimately connected. But the brain does, in fact, move uh, the body or act at that time. Uh, would you be kind enough to go to the new, next slide, please? All right, so <clears throat> how do we get all of these things to come together when we're talking about um, drill development and we're, when we're talking about community coaching? Uh, yesterday, I think we mentioned that teaching is coaching and coaching can be teaching. And if you really look at that carefully, it doesn't matter what kind of drill we're going to develop. It has to do with how are we going to provide an experience for the people, whether they're taking physical education or whether they're participating in community sport so that they will have more positive experiences and success. Uh, I learned a long time ago that if I changed my view and say to the world and to myself, have you met anyone who really intends to be bad? I haven't met many of those people at all. And so when people make mistakes, that's expected. Or in my view, that needs to be expected because we're striving for perfection, but it takes us time to get to that place. And uh, by changing your actual view of that idea, sometimes that will give you a new way to look at the performance of the person and say, well, let's try this or let's try that to see if we can improve. So this is an area, and uh, Marissa, I think, is on the uh, panel. Uh, she's the la a lady from the Philippines who does a lot of work in sport and exercise science and is really quite good at it. Um, I think she will uh, understand that sometimes sport and exercise psychology look at these kinds of things, but the true home sometimes for them has to do with motor learning and motor behavior. So she and I will overlap sometimes, but that's okay because the reality is that in the human body, there's lots of things that overlap and cooperate with each other. So one of the things when we design a drill, many times there's perceptual expertise in decision-making, especially if we're looking at a sport or an activity that requires us to make some decision-making. <clears throat> Anticipation of the conditions. As an example, sometimes in order for the, the students or the student athletes to be able to understand what's going on, they anticipate the idea. And so maybe you even let them run through the drill ahead of time before you start if there's a time component or something so that they can kind of get a practice as to what it is they're doing. 
That's perceptual expertise and decision making. What needs to be attended to? Do you simply say, okay, here's what we're doing, now go do it? Or do you give them some guidance as to what to pay attention to? Visual perception initiates the process. Now, here's the good news or the bad news. <clears throat> if we're talking about individuals who have all of their senses operating fairly well, then that visual perception, we, we learn 70 to 80% of the way we get our information is through the visual, uh, visual system. So if we leave out visual perception or visual cues, or if we leave out vision completely, we will find that some other um, area needs to take over. And so sometimes the, uh, the hearing will take over, sometimes the feeling will take over. But the, the quickest way for us to be able to uh, initiate the process of moving has to do with visual, visual perception. And I want you to really think about that when you're going to construct your drills. Um, memory retrieval. In other words, it, uh, my short-term memory, the stuff that I will remember in just a few, uh, for just a few minutes, is good if we get a trial run before we have to actually participate. So uh, many times you will see uh, some student athletes actually re mentally rehearsing what's going to be happening before they do it. And frequently that's in more closed skill opportunities because the open skills, there's a lot of things that they have to act and react to. And then problem solving. Uh, I know that uh, if you're uh, a person who loves, who absolutely loves um, to uh, f find a way forward, to experience new things, to problem solve, to do all of those things, you're very excited about um, doing many things that are going to put you in new situations. Well, how can you create in these drills new situations where they have to think about how do I solve the movement challenge that's in front of me? rather than telling them all the time what to do. Next slide, please. All right, so Sanjay, this is where I'm gonna ask you to push the button, not yet, but we're gonna push the button each one of these. So I'd like to see if all of you will uh, try this. If you have your chat box open, and this means you're gonna to have to learn or know how to spell in English. And I apologize, I have really no uh, abilities in Hindi. So uh, we'll see who's going to be the first one. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the best drills. Your Look, job- I think we could explain that to the others also, just a minute, you said you're going to explain. Uh, there is a, there's a game and what is that what is what is expected of the participant let us know so we'd share that with the participants before we start the game i mean start sure the game. Yeah. yeah game is good <laughs> um what we're going to do we'll give you the first one as an example the best drills are and then you see a bunch of letters in english that make no sense so i'm going to give <clears throat> all of you about 10 seconds to try to figure out what does that word really spell? All right, so uh, Sanjay, on that first one, let's do, oh, look at him go already. Sa uh, Sajid Kumar, first one. Push the first button, uh, my, my, our Sanjay, push the button. Measurable, that's the correct answer. So for those of you who put in measurable, you are really good. Okay. So the best drills are measurable. The second one says the best drills include blah, 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 blah. All right, so you got about 10 seconds. So answer that one if you would, if you can. Uh, you please do participants see if you can answer that. The jumbled words which are put in, try to put the words and understand what it is. words for same meaning, but you can make a word of it. Participants are answering. Second one, include scoring system goal. 
good. There we go. All right. So Sanjay, push that uh, return again. Scoring systems and goals. And I'm sorry that uh, somebody, there we go. Rosa's got it. Woohoo! Uh, good for you. All right. And the last one on this slide, play to a natural Ned. What's it supposed to say at the end? Okay, wait, Asha James got it. Uh, and uh, Sanjay hit the button. Play to a natural end. Fantastic. We have one more set of, of, uh, of these things. So if you go to the next side, Sanjay, please. I'm sorry if I get louder, but I get so excited with these no, things. It's nice <laughs> getting louder. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the best drills are blum and teach blum. All right, let's see who's got Chat box, it. try it, participants. Okay. As some of you have one of the words correct. The last word looks like movement. Uh, okay, wait, wait. Uh, in, um, Okay, uh, you're on the second one, whoever wrote that one. Ooh, keep coming, keep coming. <laughs> the last word there is movement. Correct. And the next to the last is something and teach movement. What's the first word there, if you can figure that out? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, I may have to give a give you that one uh, because um, it's uh, our game like and teach movement. The best drills are game like and teach movement. Okay, game let's try. Yeah, so uh, something. Can you push the return, please? There you go. Thank you, sir. And the next one build. Build from bloop to bloop. Some of you already, there we go. Simple to complex. Uh -huh. Prashnat, Prashant, someone. Simple I, to complex. Yeah, build from simple to complex. Mohana complex. got it. And Subzar got it. Okay, so lots of you got that one. That was good. All right, and then the last one for this little adventure is maximize bloop per participant. All right, so let's see here. Oops. Uh, Himanji got it. Um, Krishan got it. Context. Beatrice got it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and Sarjeet got it. Fantastic. So if you'd push the button to show everyone. Contacts. So maximize contacts per participant. This one is one of my favorite ones to use so that we all laugh. Uh, many times you will see people having a ball with one child or one student athlete in the middle, and then they have 50 people standing around in a circle waiting for this person to throw the ball to them. And then they throw it back to the person in the center. Is that maximizing contacts per participant? No, not at all. So we've got to think about the more times children, people, uh, students, athletes contact, the more chance they have to experience and the more chance they have to be successful. So we're going to look at, uh, if you would go to the next slide, thank you so much for participating in that. That was so much fun, at least for me it was. Um, this is a little bit about questions for you to consider as you're doing this. Is the drill fun? All right, you know, sometimes, especially if we're doing intensity training, which has to do more with um, repetition, repetition, repetition. Sometimes that gets very tiring. Well, when I was a young teacher and coach, I used to, they would say, how long are we going to do this drill? Because they thought it won't be fun. I used to tell them until I get tired, until I get tired. 
Now, since I'm a little older and a little wiser, I would say we're going to do this 10 times or we're going to do this until you get seven out of 10 or whatever it happens to be. So uh, at least it gives them a goal and hopefully through that goal, it could be fun just because they accomplished it. Does the drill provide anaerobic and aerobic conditioning? There is nothing worse than doing a bunch of drills and not having it help build our anaerobic or aerobic systems. So if we're going to do finger exercises for the drill, that is not probably going to help us do too much anaerobic or aerobic conditioning. Uh, it will do some uh, repetition for the fingers, uh, but it will not really involve a tremendous uh, amount of work on the cardiorespiratory system. So does the drill accomplish more than three objectives? All right, so now objectives, you may be thinking, oh, okay, well, maybe skill development. Uh, maybe I want that to be the big thing. Well, if so, that's great, but you need to be thinking about adding, does it do anything for conditioning as, a, as one of the objectives? Does it do anything for visual perception and decision-making? So those would be three objectives immediately that every drill that you construct or you use should have in them. Does the drill resemble parts of the game or competition? Um, it's possible to play, and uh, by the way, I used to play field hockey in a past life. And um, so uh, in that game of field hockey, is there a way that we could practice dribbling and not using cones, but using people or using something that resembles more of the game itself um, I used to, uh, again, in, uh, in my previous life, in order to uh, make the stuff less boring for the, the students, and this was in physical education class, uh, we would dribble the ball and then I'd say, okay, forward roll. So they would drop down and do a forward roll, um, uh, go a little further, uh, change balls. Uh, as you practice. Um, all those kinds of things to, again, make it more fun, more aerobically uh, involving conditioning, and also working on visual perception, because as I do the forward roll, I must take my eyes off of the ball and off of what's going on in order to be able to see things more quickly and identify them more accurately. Uh, does the drill encourage maximum participation? Oh, gee, um, I'm sure that Dr. Woody has done this before because uh, he, he not only was swimming, but many other coaching. I'm sure uh, Dr. Rosa has done this before in gymnastics. You have people waiting in lines. Oh my goodness. And if you put a stopwatch on the people, you will be shocked to see how, how little uh, a person moves during a session. So if I have them for half an hour and I do not have at least 80% participation for each child's participation, I'm doing something wrong. So I need to be thinking about what are they doing while they're waiting in line? You know, many uh, children are very, uh, um, similar in this that I have found across the world, what they wind up doing is if they're waiting in line, they do a little pushing, a little shoving, a little ho holding each other, a little putting the hands on the shoulders, all these extra kinds of things that if we had them doing something while they're waiting, that would be individual, then we probably wouldn't have uh, all the extra pushing and the fighting and the whatever else that comes from it. So you want to think about what else can I have them do while they're waiting? You might have them do that in partners while they're waiting. Trust me, it will take a little time for them to get the idea of when they're not doing something that they really can be doing something. Another one, does the drill include visual perception and decision making? 
I want you to really think about that. And if you are not um, terribly well versed in visual perception and decision making, then you might want to just read some of the things that are available on the internet. Uh, or um, I think that there's uh, Sanjay in that in that um, handbook that I sent you. Uh, there may be a chapter on something involving sports vision or vision, visual perception and decision making, um, but there's a lot of that information now on the web for free. Uh, so you want to see how can I incorporate that into drills? And then does the drill create opportunity for skill acquisition? You know, it's really nice to have them um, sit uh, or, or whatever they're doing and clap hands and do all those kinds of things. But is this really contributing to some type of skill? All right, Sanjay, if you'd give me the next one, please. All right, so the question becomes, what is a solid lesson or session plan? And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I have not uh, been able to listen to the um, things that you have had in each of your mornings. Uh, so what uh, people have begun to call things here is if we're teaching, we have a lesson plan. And if we're community coaching, we have a session plan. In my humble opinion, many of the things are similar to be used. So uh, I do not know what people have said before about what needs to be in a lesson or a session plan in terms of its format, but I thought I would share these things um, because in most of them, and I had a look of uh, over 150 different lesson plan formats that people put on the uh, internet. So I've used the internet over the last few weeks um, to see what, it, what comes up very often. And so someone's asking about uh, what does it mean by simple to complex? Okay, uh, remind me, Ashok, about that uh, when I finished, okay? Um, to put these types of things together, um, the one that I'm particularly uh, uh, excited about is to be sure that on that lesson plan session plan, you ask yourself after the lesson, those questions that are at the bottom, what went well? As you know, oftentimes we're looking at all the things that we did wrong. And that's a tough one. Because uh, we just continue to, in a sense, beat ourselves up. And I, I think uh, Marissa would, would be um, in agreement with me. We have a tendency to do that. Um, what needs to be changed? Okay. And then how might we change it for the next time that we do it? We don't have to invent a lesson or a session or a, a um, drill every single time that we go and do something, but we may find that we want to change it. Um, in my, one of my past lives, I used to teach six to eight lessons a day uh, to students. And uh, when you get into a situation where you're teaching either tumbling, gymnastics, fencing, whatever, um, you find that in uh, the first period, you wind up doing, uh, trying it one way, and then you see what works, what didn't work. On the second, uh, second hour, you try to do something a little different to see if that would work. So you can actually evaluate if you have a similar type classes uh, throughout the day to be able to see how can I change this and what worked best. All right, if you give the next slide, please. All right, so uh, part of what we're going to uh, speak about now has to do with how do I um, put into sports, how do I add sports science principles to what it is that I'm teaching or coaching? I would hope that many times these larger things are going to have to do with physical education because the idea is to get them 
to a place where they're going to be able to distinguish this so that when they go to community coaching and, and experiences, they already have an idea about these things and can actually perform them. So we're gonna look just very quickly. This is a uh, physics or a biomechanics principle that has to do with creating, uh, um, uh, you want to create spin on the ball. And what you're really talking about is the Magnus effect. All right, and so the, the effect explain, explains why paths of balls change from their normal flight. And so some examples of them can be uh, what's listed there. And you know, I am fascinated when I watch the videos and so forth on a bowler in cricket. I am fascinated. This is uh, a very unusual type of delivery of a ball. Uh, we in our country and in many other parts of the world as well have baseball, softball, but the actual delivery of that pitch or of that bowling uh, issue is, uh, is quite different. And the speeds are absolutely remarkable. Uh, Sanjay, if you would go to the next one, please. All right, so uh, this is uh, kind of what you might think about in some way, talking with the students ahead of time about why is it that we're going to be uh, looking at this particular effect for a lesson. And uh, just because I'm working with uh, children who are six and seven and eight, it does not mean at all that they cannot be using the, uh, the proper terms for things. So uh, you might say to them, what are you doing? Uh, what are we going to do to produce top spin? And then you might say, and the effect of that is what? Okay, and then they say the Magnus effect. So you've been helping them understand how things go in life, but you're also giving them a scientific principle. Um, I know we've talked about why is it that, that um, many parents all over the world, but uh, specifically if I'm listening to India correctly, uh, that uh, the parents aren't terribly excited uh, uh, about physical education and sport because they should be spending more time uh, getting cognitively uh, enriched. Well, here's an example of how we can make the link and so when the child goes home and talks about the Magnus effect, as an example, oh my goodness, suddenly the parents go, now, where did you learn that? What did you talk about? How does that work? Show me. And so uh, it, it helps to link the bridge or cross the bridge of, from how do we apply scientific principles that are uh, sports science principles <clears throat> that then bring the physical activity and the movement to a place where they can better understand. All right, Sanjay, if you would. Another example has to do with projectiles used in sports. So obviously uh, anything thrown or jumped into the air uh, that could be a body, that could be uh, a javelin, it could be a uh, discus, uh, it could be um, a cricket ball. So when you release whatever that object is, and that includes your body, when your body leaves the ground, it follows a path called a parabola. Okay? Now we all know that because we've taken biomechanics and we've taken kinesiology in all of the things that we have done, but we have a tendency to not call what it is, what it is. And so again, uh, if we're talking about a flight path of something, well, let's call it a parabola or whatever the equivalent is in whatever language we're using. So what activities use the parabolic flight path? Now, those are some examples. So get ready, everybody. What's one example that is not listed here? Go. 
Write it down quickly in your chat box. All right, are we, we're all asleep. Oh, goodness. Okay, somebody's got Javelin, it's up there. Boomerang, okay. Shot What's another put. one? Shot put, uh, okay, ball. ball. Uh, ball. Torque I love, but that's not a thing, you know, what have you done? Volleyball, that's, oh, Zinal, I love you. Mm, volleyball, jump. so good. Basketball. Long jump. Yeah, rugby, football. Rugby. All right, now, when somebody over there says football kick, all right, what do you mean? Is that football as in soccer or football as in American football? Martial art, karate. Ah, there's frisbee. a soccer frisbee. Oh, that's an interesting one. All right, American so fantastic. Football. Thank you. So when you are presenting those kinds of uh, lessons or those kinds of sessions, then you want to somehow ask questions about what's happening here. So the next thing we would uh, ask is, well, what causes that parabola? And one of the things has to do with the person's weight. If they're uh, actually jumping or doing something, it could also be the weight of whatever is being thrown or put into the air. Because we have to remember that gravity will also play a role. And so then that piece needs to be explained. And then air resistance makes a difference. So if we look at a heavy object like a shot put, that's fairly unaffected by air resistance. And uh, it's because the air is much lighter than the shot put, okay? So the shot put being as heavy as it is, the parabola, when we look at the next slide, will be pretty, pretty even. But the shuttlecock in badminton, as an example, when you look at this, you'll see that it goes very nicely, but then suddenly when it gets to its height, it very quickly comes down. And so as we're looking at visual perception and decision-making, if we know that a heavy object is going to be in a parabola that is going to look equidistant, that is going to be much different where we stand to receive whatever it is, than it would be for a shuttlecock. So as an example, if we're playing badminton, this, <laughs> excuse me, approach, this shot put approach means that we should be willing to stand outside of the line in the back because that particular shuttlecock is going to go out of bounds. Okay, so we won't hit that shot. But the shuttlecock itself, because of its light weight, we may need to stand on the line or near the line and the, the uh, shuttlecock will be considered in when it comes down. So those are important pieces uh, to identify. And is there a difference when I play badminton and when I play tennis as to where it goes? You know, where is it landing, et cetera? And I would assume that most of you who play uh, or who uh, teach or coach uh, sports that are going to have a back line, many times don't you ask them to actually stand outside of the court. So again, visually, they can see where that back line is and they can much more easily run up than they can to run back. Okay, that's much easier, and that's got to do with visual perception and decision making. Okay, if you would be kind enough to go to the next one. Now, here's how we get all sorts of crazy things going on. We uh, probably somewhere have studied these equations, okay, and um, uh, some people will get very excited positively, and other time, they, they will not. So the idea here is 
if the students are versed enough in equations, you can give these to them and actually give them um, experiments to see uh, what's, what's going to happen with these things. And so I want you to, to think about how can we also incorporate a little bit of math and a little bit of Sir Isaac Newton's ideas into what it is that we're having them learn. Uh, because as soon as the light bulb goes on in their head, they get so excited about, oh, and so the next time I may have to try half as hard or the next time I may have to try harder. Okay, uh, what about the next one, please? Okay, and I found this one yesterday um, on the internet and um, my home uh, where I was born was uh, near Chicago, Illinois in the US. And uh, I still am, a, I'm a life member of this state association, but I thought you might be interested in this. And some of it's got to do with curriculum, but more importantly, it's got to do with uh, appropriate practices. And if you look uh, down, it'll say activities are selected carefully so that they match students' ability levels and are also safe for all students. All right, so that's a best practice. So as you're developing these lessons and these sessions, you want to make sure that uh, they are safe for all students and then also they match the ability. Uh, yesterday or day before, we were talking a little bit about um, activities and what do you do with people who are a little more gifted than those who are in uh, the uh, daily class? Well, uh, it may be possible if, if you look from a curriculum standpoint to say, well, maybe at this time we have all those who are uh, novice or more beginners and then at another point in the day, we say, okay, those people who are going to have um, a little better skill, and you can decide that how, how you wish, uh, but then they are scheduled for that particular time of the day, so that you're grouping them more by ability levels, and so that you can get each of them to prosper, rather than just having all of them in the same class. That's a, a possibility uh, that sometimes we need to think about uh, because that has to do with where are they in the learning process, not about what can I schedule the easiest. And then on the other side, uh, it talks about inappropriate practices. And so um, I don't know if, um, if some of the teachers and the community coaches use, punish, uh, use exercise as punishment but if so, that's not a, an appropriate practice any longer. Uh, we have this thing over here called a duck walk. And it's where the person uh, gets down um, so that the knees are totally bent. And then you put your hands under your armpits and then you walk. This is a disaster and that's used as a punishment, but it's a disaster because those people who have knee issues or who are not uh, very well, uh, well, very flexible in their quadriceps and their hamstrings, they genuinely suffer. And uh, so after the student gets out of school uh, or gets out of the, um, the, uh, the uh, leisure environment, they will never, do that again. Never. And again, there goes your attitude, your, your uh, belief system saying this is ridiculous. Okay, if you would go to the next one, please. All right, this one, I wanted to uh, try to uh, see what we can do with cricket. Um, I, uh, are you, uh, could somebody let me know, are you uh, um, familiar with station work? Just somebody answer if you would. 
When I say station work, do you know what I mean? Yes, okay, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. Um, so we make up four stations uh, for the students and uh, we look at batting, fielding, bowling, and throwing, okay? Yeah, uh, uh, it's Maru, Murugan, I'm sorry. Um, he, he, he or she talks about circuit training. What a beautiful thing, circuit training. But we can also do this as we go. And so here's four stations. So you ask yourself, before I set up these four stations, what biomechanical principles do I want, to, want them to work on at each station? So um, just for fun, let's take uh, batting. And um, what is a principle that we can work on on batting? Just write one down. Okay, you want to work on biomechanics. All right, there's one. Stability, defense, when the ball hits the bat, and that's action, reaction, footwork, okay, focus on the ball. Ooh, we got some things we could say about that one. Uh, yeah, action, reaction, impact, fantastic. Eye hand, who's that eye hand? Wajid, you are brilliant. I want all of you to seriously think about if you say hand-eye coordination, oh, no, 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 slap your hand. No, no, no. It's eye-hand coordination because you must see it first before you can react. So please change your language to be the correct scientific way of looking at it. When you look at stuff that's written on the internet and in the books, you will just laugh once you understand this eye-hand coordination piece. All right, you all are doing wonderful neuromuscular coordination. Okay, Newton's third law, ooh, that's a goodie. Judgment of line and length, yes, all of those things. So when you set up each of the stations, maybe on a card or if, you know, if, you're, if you have a highly sophisticated thing, which I do not or I never had, uh, you might use an iPad or something to write all this down at each of the stations, but let the students and the athletes know what it is that you're, uh, what, what the underlying reason for why are we practicing this today? Because this will help them to even teach themselves. And the idea here is for them to take away things that will, they can do at home, they can do with their friends, and they can educate the parents and the grandparents on look what I learned today. Or when the parents are playing with them, they can say, aha, dad or papa, you forgot to think about your foot because that affected your hip. Whoa, how good is this? Okay, the next one, if you would. All right, I want to uh, finish up here with this idea of collaboration. And um, I have a whole series of questions uh, for people to ask themselves when they think about doing this. And uh, I'm so excited for um, the university and for the ministry and for all of you participating in this because you have an opportunity to genuinely collaborate. And uh, Dr. Kishore and Dr. Usha and Dr. Sanjay, I'm going to put a little pressure on you now <laughs> um, to see if you can find ways to take and have the university people conduct the research and the people who are in the field, the ones that really count because they really work with the, the children and the, the athletes and the students, uh, to practice and collaborate together so that you're working in teams to solve a question. 
bring an answer to a question, whatever that happens to be. And so usually the questions, for instance, if we looked at this chat, there are some wonderful questions being asked. I'm sorry that we don't have time to answer all of them. However, um, Usha and company, you could look through those and find different kinds of questions that need to be answered, uh, both with sports science and with community physical educators. It may also be that you will find there will be questions that are unanswered about how do we get parents to appreciate what we do? Or how do we get the student athletes to help us help the parents to appreciate what we do? Right? Because you've got to be working on that all the time because you also have a cultural thing as we do here. I mean, not everybody loves to be physically active and uh, sees, <laughs> they may see the benefit, but they don't move. Um, so you want to see, well, how can we integrate this research and practice and answer questions that will help us to move this whole situation in India further? How can we do that? So why do we wanna do that? Well, sharing of ideas and expertise there is nothing like that. It is terrific. Oh, someone, I'm sorry, asked, what is collaboration? Collaboration means that you work together and I will call it kind of like a, 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 a team. You work together to solve a common question. All right, does that, I hope that helps. Uh, let me see, uh, Yasman Khan. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. My uh, I, I really apologize for that because nobody understands my last name either and I can't, uh, I, I'm sensitive to that. <laughs> um, also, to develop answers to questions, for sure, and develop strategies as to, well, is, this, is it possible for us to change this? Is it possible for us to not only change it, but how can we change it? And then see if that works. Um, you could be on the, uh, the cutting edge of designing and constructive and managing things that are going to be quite different than what they were before. We do not have to move mountains every time. We need to move little pieces of the mountain, like a rock or two, that eventually becomes moving the mountain. And um, immersion in physical activity and sport for now and in the future. Because the children that you have now will obviously, we hope, become young adults and older adults. And so when they look back on the experience that they've had, what are they going to say about it? in terms of the actual content and what they learned from it. Yeah, Naveen put down a little change makes a big difference. Fantastic. Okay, um, if you would go to the next one. These are some questions and uh, I've already sent the PowerPoint Look up. to... Uh, Yes. Luca, could I just, Sanjay, could you say in Hindi collaboration? Collaboration meaning, it means Sahio in Hindi. How we can help each other to move further. Mm. You can say that. How we can this physical education ke ko aage bada sakte hai. Uh, yehi madam ne samjhaya hai. Thank you. Iske baare mein abhi hum discuss kar rahe Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, so should we participate? And uh, there are a lot of questions to ask and I'll only select a few because uh, you, you have the slides and feel free to share them. These are just some of my thoughts on uh, how we can do this. Um, should we participate in this? Do we want to be involved in it? If you already say that no, our, our, um, our school or our community really isn't interested in this, then that's fine. But say no at the beginning. 
don't say yes. And then a few weeks or months later, you say, oh, no, we really don't want to do this because then it really disappoints others who are excited about this. So when you, if you decide no, it's okay, but let those who want to continue. Um, who will get the work done? That's a big, big question. So you need to decide that. And what are some key lessons for our team as adults? What can we learn as we do it? Because the fun part about doing collaboration or helping one another on programs or projects is that we all learn something. So the students, athletes, community, parents, researchers, we all learn something. And by the way, those of you who are um, uh, field-based professionals, you are really, really helping the university people because part of what they must do at that level is to conduct research. And wouldn't it be fun to do research that is meaningful, helpful, makes people grow, they want to participate, and then they see themselves in print because it gets published. What an exciting thing to be able to help people. Uh, if we go to the next uh, slide. Here are other questions. All right. So um, one of them is, what are some of the barriers or conflicts that make progress difficult? Sometimes that happens. Sometimes we think, oh my goodness, we've tried everything we know. And then we bring ourselves all together and we say, well, wait a minute, maybe we're the wrong messenger. Maybe the students or the student athletes or the parents need to help us, right? Because we all have a wonderfully beautiful message but sometimes we are not the right messenger. And when you work collaboratively or when you work together, you can figure out how to best put the message forward to the group that it needs. Um, I have to personally and professionally give a big thank you to Professor Dr. Rosa. Uh, Rosa, I have known you for many, many years. And I have watched you grow, and I'm sure you've watched me do some things too, but uh, I've watched you grow into a person who genuinely recognizes and uses this notion of who is the right messenger to get the message across. So uh, hugs and kisses to you because you are uh, quite remarkable as a person, but also as a professional. And I thank you for that. Um, how much money do we need? All right. And so one of the questions you ask yourself is, do we really need money to begin this? Or do we really need someone to volunteer and take it on? Uh, in American English, we call that to champion the cause. So, and that just takes time and effort but it may not take finances at the beginning. And then the last question here is, how do we monitor progress? This is such an important part. How do we monitor progress? And uh, I think someone else at some point will talk about uh, assessment and so forth, but we must remember to do that so that we can continue to improve. Uh, the next slide, please. And I want to thank you so much for letting me have this opportunity to uh, visit with you. And if you have um, more con uh, questions about uh, ICSPE and ways in which we as an organization can be helpful to you, please do not hesitate to uh, contact Detlef Duman, our executive director, or, of course, our infamous and well-respected Dr. Uri Schaefer, our president. So many thanks, and uh, we can open it for questions. 
Dr. Darling, should we show the, uh, the other two documents which you sent for us? Uh, yeah, if you want to. Uh, these just will be, thank just you. Just share a page the, of it. Uh, yes, uh, the, these will be available for you. And um, as soon as, uh, as soon as um, uh, you, uh, um, the organization the of joined. Science. Luca, can you yeah. see? It? Yeah, and so um, ICSPI put this together uh, a few years ago and it's uh, the sixth edition. Uh, and uh, thank you for rolling it up. Uh, this has some beautiful explanations of all of these different kinds of words that we talk about when we talk about sports science. Um, do, uh, yeah, let's keep going uh, because I think there's like a content. This one was done in 2013. So we've done this now for six times. Look at all these beautiful explanations of disciplines of sports science, okay, and then academic disciplines uh, with physical education, um, with motor behavior, uh, with, um, I, I think there's even one there somewhere along in sport management, and then uh, maltreatment in sport of children. And then they talk a little about occupations and careers uh, that are uh, possible as we look at the world globally. So uh, this is available to you. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would assume that you folks know how to share that around. And sure. then if you could give us the other ah. one, my sweet. Other one, other one. Uh, this one I put together for you um, just to look at different kinds of sports science websites that you might find of interest. Some of them are fairly, uh, you know, like American Society of Biomechanics. Uh, that might be a little uh, high up. Uh, not that you can't understand, but, you know, it's talk, you talk in the science language. And other parts are beautifully done uh, for uh, the, the practitioners. So, okay, here's the science. Now, here's ways in which you might be interested in using it. And uh, I tried to also put sports that, uh, or activities that are not the only ones, for instance, if we were to do something for the US, my goodness, American football, basketball, and baseball. Well, there are a whole bunch more of sports uh, that are wonderful for people to participate in, but you know, uh, we just have to go, keep going to the same things all the time. And I think sometimes that's why people get uh, bored, you know, uh, if they already can play volleyball, then why am I taking a core class in volleyball and not getting any more skilled? Um, or why do I go to a community where the only thing they offer is cricket? And not only do I not like cricket, but I'm not good at it. So are there other options? Okay. All right. So again, I appreciate that. And if you would be kind enough to share that uh, with everybody any way you can, uh, I think that, uh, that you all would uh, benefit greatly. Uh, and it would also help XP get the word out um, about the different kinds of areas in sports science that will help physical education. Yes, darling, we'll, we'll put this in the website. Whatever documents are given, we're going to share that. And we'll also see certain in, important information we'll translate in Hindi for them, whoever requires mm -hmm. it. We'll just see for it. But definitely, we'll, be, we'll make this available to our participants. So thank you so much. But we'll be going get on to the questions. It. Dr. Sanjay Prajapati, please. Thank you, ma'am. First, I, I would like to say uh, the session was very like outstanding, ma'am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, it was fun to, to uh, share with you. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, you told the participant to, you will be giving one answer. So participants have asked, like, what do you mean is simple to complex? Okay. Uh, simple means easy. Okay. It's, we can get it in one or two tries. Complex means, oh my goodness, we have to learn this, and then we have to learn this, then we have to put it together. 
We have to learn this, and then we have to put it together. So uh, example, um, a tennis serve is really a very complex skill because you've got to toss up the ball, you've got to then prepare the racket, you've got to do the backswing, and then you've got to do the contact. That's a, quite a bit of things to do at the same time. Whereas walking, once I get my balance, I just go walk, 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 and that's very simple. Uh, it, for Dr. Uri, it would be like taking uh, swimming. Um, I can learn to float, that's pretty simple, but to do the butterfly in competition, oh my goodness, that's very complex. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more question is there, ma'am. Like you have shown the figure of uh, short put and settle cock, that uh, parabola oh, yeah. figure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the impact of their weight in air resistance due to it, it can travel. So the question is that whether the time of ascent and time of descent is affected by the height and weight of the object? The, the short answer is, uh, I, I will say, I would, if I were you, if, if I were doing a teaching, I would turn it around and ask you, what do you think? Okay, but because we have um, not exactly perfect uh, communication back and forth, uh, yes, it makes a difference. And when you see that parabola going for the uh, shuttlecock, uh, the thing has enough energy to get there, and then suddenly the weight of it is not what's taking over, it's the air resistance. And so that's why it cuts it a little shorter. If you look again at the shot, which is much heavier, that weight, not only for the height, but also for the distance, if you will, that will even out because that continues to be heavier than the air resistance. So, uh, and I bet you he knew that, or he or she knew that answer already. You just testing me. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Over to Usha, ma'am. Please, Dr. Yuri. Unmute, please. Unmute. Darlene, what a fantastic presentation. What a valuable thoughts and such a wonderful delivery of, of a topic, which in my view, is probably one of the most important topics for teachers and coaches. And why? Because you have shown in a very systematic but simple way how to integrate motor skills with scientific evidence and why children and youth when teachers and coaches are, are, are uh, practicing with them and teaching them, coaching them, they can use the scientific knowledge in order not to repeat the same movement once and again and, and make the training boring. Yeah. If you understand why you practice, if you understand what is behind what the coach is asking you to do, then you come with a much greater motivation and you are happy rather than go and shoot the, the ball to the basket or yeah. under 100 meter or jump to the pool and swim 100 uh, freestyle. You have shown us how to take the scientific findings and make it so interesting in the learning process, in the practicing process, in the coaching process. A job well done. Darlene, you're you. great, and I'm so <laughs> proud of you. Thank and I you. want to relate with your permission to, uh, to, to the last session of your presentation when you talked about collaboration. And I want to highlight from my perspective one item, and that is the role of the parents. 
because we have discussed and we are discussing the role of physical education teachers and, and the college uh, professors and the university professors and the coaches. And I think we need to go back to the parents and tell them that whatever they expect the coaches and the physical education teachers to do with their children will not reach the point that they could reach if they will not see to it that it happens, will support it, and will actually be part of the process. Nowadays, parents are sending their kids away to the community center, to the YMCA's, to the sport clubs, just excuse me for saying it, to get rid of them for some hours uh, and create <laughs> some <laughs> energy so when they come back home, they can relax and, and treat them properly. No, my dear friends, this is not the right <laughs> way nowadays. Parents, especially those who are all day long involved with high tech and computers and, and innovations and, and whatnot, scientific work, they need to be involved in the educational process and with the education of sport, physical activity and the physical education. At least that is my, my concern. And I think this is another uh, element which we need to address in order to bring about a change where parents will resume their understanding that they cannot just expect the university or the college or the physical education teachers or the coaches to settle problems and to teach their children and everything will be fine. This is not going to work. Yeah. So again, Darlene, thank you so much really from the bottom of my heart for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you have enriched my knowledge as to how to deliver this complicated <laughs> issue and I'm very happy. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. It's uh, it's uh, it's fun. It's just fun. And uh, thank you. We need to all go and prosper. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Yuri. Dr. Rosa, please. Well, what can I say? I mean, listening to Darlene is always a pleasure because she has such a passion and knowledge about what she does. And I also know that working with the skills, technical skills and motor learning, it's her pa it's one of her passion as well. And you explain it so easily and so basic. So thank you very much. I, there are two elements uh, that I want to make comments in the sense when it is from simple to complex, okay? And from easy to difficult, or as a famous saying indicates, a long walk starts with a step, okay? So <laughs> you go little by little, that's how we do, that's how we train. We cannot start by the complex thing. So it's a principle and it is so good that Darlene emphasized that and there were several questions related with that. So don't go to the complex. Just go little by little, okay? That's the way to do. And besides, we always have to remember that the basic has to be properly learned in mm. order to get more complex movements, okay? The other aspect is one question that they will they ask there. And I know when we're speaking, we don't have all the questions there. So I'll leave it to you because I, I know you will have more words to say like, what do we do to be a good teacher? What do we do to be a good coach? And what I would say is whatever you do, do it with passion and do it well. That's what we do. And we always have to treat, and that's what I say to my student, we have to treat those uh, girls and boys there as they were our children, as they were our relatives. So we have to treat them all well. Now, in terms of uh, how to make things easier in the sense how to engage everybody, and you gave wonderful examples of classes 
in physical education, in coaching, how sometimes we believe that by discipline and we have to be one at a time, maybe we may then wait long hours before doing an exercise. So those what you, the examples were beautiful. And another one, which I think we have to elaborate much more is how to make a people understand, and I'm not saying about us, because we are all converted to physical education, but to all the other disciplines that through physical education, we can teach all the other disciplines. Your example from physics, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. So it's, it takes us more, and if you can provide like more examples, like the one you did in terms of how we can teach the other subjects through physical education that we know. But when we are doing, you know, this curriculum discussions in terms of how many hours or what to dedicate to PE, then the other subjects, they get, you know, alert, like, okay, what do we do? Because still in the society, we are seen as brain and muscles, not, not that we think. So sometimes uh, I remember that I have two jokes from 20 years ago. And it's when I was doing, uh, 22 years ago, when I went to do my PhD in Australia and I arrived, we were, you know, Venezuelans like minorities in there. We were among other nationalities, not even counting in, you know, in, in Australia because it were so few being there. And I remember we were just three Venezuelans in the whole university, which is huge. And then the other two were studying biology, you know, science, biology. And they said, you can't so far away to study physical education. <laughs> That's what they said. So people <laughs> really don't understand, I mean, how, our complexity and what we do and how we can embrace all areas through doing physical activity because we teach mind, body, mind and body and social behavior. So please, Darlene, if you can give some more details about that. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. Uh, Dr. Rosa, I just would like to, uh, to ask Darlene. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking, but I would like to, 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 to make a point. Berlin said to one of the, uh, during the presentation, that it's not, uh, that it's not hand coordination, it's an eye-hand coordination, right, Berlin? Yeah. But you Americans are always using, it has to be forth and back. Wait, I'm sorry, I, you broke up, say again. You Americans always are using the term back and forth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> forth and back. <laughs> I can put <laughs> the B before F. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Beatrice, for your remarks, please. You need to unmute. Okay. Well, Darlene, you are just wonderful. Everybody told you, and your creativity, just great to teach such an area that is more exact and uh, and in wonderful way. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I enjoyed very much, and uh, I, when you talk about collaboration, I and then the quart of practice, the self perception. I start remembering uh, how difficult it is to work with uh, school and students and parents, special parents, you um, emphasize this, uh, with the difference in motor skill of children. I mean, some of them have facilities in motor skills and others do not have, especially those that do not have, they have this pressure of the peer group and parents and schools to win and that they probably develop some uh, feeling, very bad feeling about themselves. And in your experience, uh, you have experience in working with all these configurations, school students and parents relate to this difference in motor skills? 
Yeah, so, um, let, me, let me ask the question okay. because um, we're all looking for just, ways in which we can try something different because whatever we're doing might not be working. Um, in your countries, do they have, um, at the schools, do you have something like an open house where parents come in the evenings to go to the classes that their children... Roka, we can't hear you. Could you be louder, please? Yeah. Um, do you have um, in your schools like an evening, like an open house where the, the parents can come uh, and then go to the classes that the students have and talk to the teachers and the uh, administrators? Do you have something like that? Well, in the private schools, yes, more frequently. But in the public schools, more difficult. Sometimes they have every two months, you know, a meeting, but many parents do not go. Um, one of the things that I, I would like to suggest is to talk to administrators uh, to see if you in physical education can have a night, don't worry about the rest of the school, but <laughs> because it will spread, all right? But to have a night where they could invite parents and students to come for an hour of physical education and then teach them all whatever it is. Because sometimes, if you can get the parents to participate one time a semester or one time a half a year or whatever, then they will see what their child can do and what, their, uh, what, what is going on. But also to me, at the next step would be to invite parents to come in and talk about um, how their child is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be either an invitation to the office uh, or for you to call them or for you to go to their house. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so some way, and this, I know this takes time. I know this takes time. But when a parent has perhaps a special needs child or maybe someone who is really brilliant in math but cannot coordinate the body and the brain uh, very well. And so for you to take the step forward and say to them, well, here's what you can work on with them at home, sometimes that will make the difference. Not so much to get them to be star athletes, but for them to see that it's important for them to be physically active and to do, because they're stuck with their body for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, and, and maybe it won't work, but if you do nothing, nothing will change. So, uh, but uh, uh, Beatrice, I am confident that you, because of who you are, you are constantly looking for how to make different linkages. And if those of you who are participating in this get nothing else, but just get the ember and the spark in your heart to get your brain to think about how can I make their lives better, then all of us have accomplished what we're setting out to do. I don't know, does that help a little? Yes, well, sure. That's, that's a one stone after the other stone, not that's the right. thing. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maria, for your remarks, please. Unmute, unmute, please. All right, okay, hello. Can I be heard? Yeah, we can show and see you too. Yes. Okay. So as always, it's a delight um, to be learning from Darlene uh, all the 
sessions I've, I've uh, sat in where she was the speaker is always very enriching. And what is uh, what really stands out um, this evening was what she mentioned um, in the beginning about the intersection between motor and uh, cognitive learning, actually coming from the sports psychology lens. This is really very important because motor and cognitive learning, while we study it separately, actually happens together in real life, you know. Um, the way we study and specialize in our fields make it appear as if um, any of our singular specializations are superior than the other. But actually, when we're talking about the person, the student, all of our uh, specializations come into four. And so um, even as a sports psychologist in our college, where we have the Department of Sports Science and the Department of PE, whenever the entire faculty get together, it's always very interesting because the PE teachers talk about motor learning, how to improve motor learning. And in the sports science, we talk about biomechanics, sports psychology, sport nutrition. And unless we really agree that we're talking about the child, the student, the athlete, one person, and all of us would have to get together, then that is where the collaboration, which Darlene brought up in the, in the end, really uh, becomes very important. That I think we are in this generation where collaboration is most important gone are the days when we really have to stick to our own little corner. So even as PE teachers, I would really encourage you, as what Darlene uh, said in her talk, to collaborate with other sports scientists so that you can be a better PE teacher. And by sharing, for instance, your, um, your specializations or your learnings from PE to the other people also, let's say coaches, um, teachers, parents, then they will also be enriched by your contribution. So the intersection between P and, and life is even more real because when we talk about physical education, it is education. It is the education of the total person, but the, the, the entry door is the physical. Okay, so we're educating the entire child, but through kinesthetic means. That is why there is no area of education that will not involve physical education. Even math can be taught physically. Like if a child is uh, weak, for instance, in the um, abstract reasoning of math, if we are able to translate it into physical movement, then a child can learn math through the body. Okay, the problem is the educational system really favors the, the abstract reasoning type of education. And that's where we as, uh, not we, you as physical educators really have to step up and um, really show our, the parents that physical education is not just physical education, but really education for life. And so, um, uh, Darlene also talked about PE as an experience. And I think we need to focus on that also. It's not just skill building or motor learning, but we are building an experience. We are creating an experience where the child will become active for life because that is the lifelong skill that we are building, not specific sports skills only, but a predisposition for physical activity for life. And if we, of course, there's a lot of argument about, you know, some, some, uh, some uh, people saying that 80% to 90% of what we learn in school will be obsolete by the time this child graduates. So here we're talking about how quick um, knowledge content will change over the years. So we need to think about what is it in PE, what is the 20% life skill that will um, stay for life. So we need to inverse the relationship in terms of the 20% should be the 80%. The lifelong skills should really be um, uh, the majority of what we do in PE rather than content and skills that they may not be able to take on by the time they graduate. All right. So we need, we are challenged to think about that. What is it? What is the lifelong skill or the lifelong learning? that our subject in PE will matter uh, from graduation and beyond. 
Okay, so that's that's just a question that I'm posing to everyone. And also, the relationship between the teacher and the student. I'd like to highlight that too, um, because the children or our students will forget what we taught them, but they will never forget how we treated them. And sometimes when we have reunions with our teachers, we will always remember how good or bad they made us feel. We will forget the lesson years after. Okay, same with, with, uh, with coaches. And so our relationship with, with our children when we are teaching them is most important because that will set them up to learn. If a child is scared of the teacher, if the child is not happy, no matter how fantastic and how many, much credentials we have, we will not be able to teach a child. The open door, the open window there is really the relationship between teacher. And I think uh, uh, Darlene may mention uh, uh, um, something on that. And so relationship will last beyond our classes. And so we need to also focus on that. And she mentioned something about meaningful research. Um, we need to also be alert. Okay, what is it about the PE experience that is worth uh, studying because that will feed into our practice. So we talk about evidence-based practice, but practice-based evidence is also as important that our search for knowledge generation is also guided, but what, what, what really happens? Okay, so... Uh, I guess, yeah, those were the points. I was, you know, uh, encoding all my thoughts when Darlene was uh, talking. I was just reading it out. But I, I really thank Darlene for uh, exciting all of us, for uh, igniting our uh, desire to be better teachers. So thank you, Darlene, for that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, Dr. Kisho, please. Joseph? Thank you very much, Dr. Usha. I would like to place on the card, uh, uh, you know, sincere appreciation and uh, for the excellent presentation, Dr. Darling. And I think it was a well thought of presentation. And she had, I think, done a lot of uh, homework uh, into what exactly the requirement, the demand of this uh, particular, uh, you know, program which we are having, the course which we are operating, Hello India PE Community Education Program. And out of her experience of the last uh, first session, and she has come into the crux, I think she has, uh, 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 you know, developed a lot of insight into the requirement of uh, Indian community coaching and peace. I think this is something which is most relevant and uh, something which is the need of the hour for our country now to design or redesign uh, the drills and lessons. It can be developed. It is to be developed also. We need to have developed new, new one. Or if it is something which is existing, the drills and lessons, it should be design, redesigned in such a way that the sports science principle has rightly been pointed out by Dr. Lark, Darlene Incorporated. Of course, the drills which are existing in our country too, in PE and community coaching, are the one which we have adopted from the rest which are the best practices in the rest of the world. But I think it uh, need to be closely introspective on how exactly the points which exactly what Dr. Darlene has mentioned are being uh, incorporated, especially on motor and cognitive learning and also on the part of collaboration. So the collaboration is something which is we are lacking. Uh, here in our country, we have several segments like PE segment, physical education, community coaching, are different segments. Elite coaching is different segments. The sports science also they have, but it is not so established. And it is something which is to be, uh, which is something which we have to design in such a way that uh, it get into the uh, uh, the lessons and drills, every lessons and drills which are being imparted throughout the country. So I think it is that is why uh, she has emphatically uh, even portioned us, Dr. Usha and me, uh, to have this collaboration done uh, and we will take it like a spirit and I will, we will definitely do our best and uh, thank you so much for your very valuable suggestions uh, which we will definitely try to do our best and in, in our uh, uh, drills and lessons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kishu, sir. Um, indeed, darling, I think PhD in motor learning, when I heard that itself is such a specialized area, 
Uh, there's one, uh, I mean, I, uh, there are a lot of questions coming in. Here we have a concept where punishment, exercises punishment is often one major issue. And um, I think role of parents, researchers, we don't have any documentation. Because since I was writing a chapter, Rosa was asking me, what about the documentation? We have a real problem. So maybe you could guide us and help us so that in terms of collaboration with this PE course, can we have a research? Because we have almost 4,000 participants coming in. Definitely, this could be a good platform to know what the experiences are. But we have taken an initiative this time. Is uh, We have made a, on our website, we have asked our PE teachers to upload videos and also write their stories, what they have come up with. So we are starting that this batch from Monday onwards, we said it's open. And if something is really good, I thought I'll ask Rosa if that also can be, um, uh, I mean, if it can be, um, uh, I mean, printed or given a publicity outside the country will be selected, uh, papers could be taken in. So I asked them to narrate, put in their stories on a website. So this is what we are planned for. And indeed it was a wonderful session I think it's a memory, but it was like watching a movie. We never thought, you know, Rosa, but I think the climbers came in. That was the biggest challenge for us. So thank you so much. I think um, there's lots of questions, but um, I think um, documents and documentation is what we lack, especially in our context, as Kishosa rightly pointed out. So I think um, with this uh, collaboration, definitely I think it will open up more doors. And with such a huge participants, I'm sure we can take up research and areas so that we can start documenting and we'll be known in the global, we would like to be known in the global sector because most of the research in India is not coming in the picture. Now we want India to come in the picture. So I'm sure this platform is going to help us a lot. So coming to the end, uh, on Monday, before we end, I would say Monday we have Professor Margaret Whitehead, who's the founder of liter uh, physical literacy, uh, who's consented to be a guest speaker. I need to thank Rosa because she took the initiative for it. And Monday, Monday, we have a very eminent personality coming in. But she especially mentioned is she does she wants questions. She wants to be challenged. You know, this is what she put forward to us. I don't want people to play. So all the participants, please be prepared accordingly. She said, I want to ask many questions. And that would be nice. Where we have a founder of physical literacy going to have a session with us on Monday. So on behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, uh, I need to thank Darling Kluka, hats off to you because great orator. I think as an administrator, orator, sportsman, you're outstanding, multifaceted personality. And proud, you know, especially taking up this. Thank you so much, uh, Darling. It was wonderful knowing you. And uh, the second time where you and you're throughout sitting with us. And it's a great learning for us too. Because every day has been a learning lesson. And I've taken note of some of the learnings that you've given us. Thank you so much for your not only really valuable presence, but a valuable contribution. We look forth, uh, I mean, for constant support. I'm sure you can help us, help India in the P map to come up. I'm sure you could do that. Thank you so much, Professor you enrich, Dark. You enrich my heart and my head. You truly do. You are amazing. Thank you. you all of you folks. Absolutely I to amazing. I need to tell the participants, the darling Kluka, early morning, 7.30, with a cup of coffee, coming in for a session, which you can't think of the Indian participant. That's great. So thank you so much, darling. I'd like to thank Dr. Yuri, where we have the president of XP with us, president and the vice president of XP with us. Then what else do we need? I think that's something which is great. So thank you so much, Dr. Yuri. We, we need a lot of support from you because you have a lot of things, like such as, because Israel is quite competent with a lot of scientific technological support. So please do help us and give us some tips and bits which can help in our sporting arena too. We look forward to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuri. I'd like to thank doc, uh, Dr. Rosa because I said every time I keep telling, it's you have made this a global event. And uh, I was telling Dr. Kishosa too, Rosa has thought we'll have an international webinar with uh, uh, if you can make that possible. And that would be nice where we could really make it a real global event where things could, we could see that things happening. Thank you so much, Rosa, for the constant support. Bringing in the international to this Sports Authority of India is actually, is actually your hands. You have been the ambassador. You have been the coordinator outside the country, coordinating and getting this done. Thank you so much, Professor Rosa. And with your smiles, <laughs> thank you. I'd like to thank Beatrice. Thank you so much. Because every time you come with some questions, or the other, I kept waiting, what kind of questions are you going to ask? Because that's happening every time. 
Thank you so much for your valuable presence. And we look forward to your session in the near future. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maria, because I think uh, mental health is something which you all look forward to. There was a huge appreciation for your session the last time. And we look forward to your session for this time. Thank you so much for your valuable presence and your contribution. I'd like to thank Dr. Sanjay Prajapati for being the co-host. Thank you so much, Sanjay. And uh, I'd like to thank my dear teachers and my dear friends, because I am one among you. We all are together. And uh, it's every day we keep getting energy from you. In another 20 days time, I think you all are going to get younger. That's what you have been giving us. So my PE teachers, all of you, a real thanks to you. It's because you have made this platform possible. I'd like to thank all those who those give us the technical support. I'd like to thank Dr. Sanjeev Patel, who's been constantly behind, working day and night for this. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Sujit Panigrahi and also Mr. Hari and Pranesh for their valuable uh, technical support. I'd like to thank each one and all for your valuable presence and uh, see you on Monday at the same time. And namaste. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Namaste. Uh, Hari, can we have feedback?